Oh, uh. So the reason, the reason I came from the back, it wasn't about fanfare or anything like that. It wasn't that. It had nothing to do with that. It's just uh, something seems to be happening here, and you need to pray for me. So like literally before I bring the word of God, I feel like I need to go to the loo first. And uh, so last time, remember I said I was going to preach and do that? So this time I thought I'm going to wake it up, but then it so, just so happened you guys picked him up. Anyway, but uh, it's so lovely to have everyone here. Are you excited? Looking forward to hearing the word of God? Wasn't it amazing just hearing the stories about Uganda? God is so good, isn't it? He is so amazing, and I'm so glad that he's building his kingdom in the way that he is building. And uh, I just want to say to the team, thank you so much for what you shared. I thought it was really inspiring, really encouraging, but also with those two mixed messages, but also they are really profound. If you are not ready, don't go, and if you are ready, don't uh, go. And, uh, but actually what it actually means is like we want you to go because it's going to impact your life. So the next mission trip is happening. So please do sign up for that because it will change your life. I just want to point out as well, Aloysia over there, she went on a mission trip. She joined one of our regions beyond churches from the UK, and they went to Lesotho. And uh, she was telling me all about it. It really had an amazing impact to a point that I think you asked your family to go there as well. So her family went on mission because she, she just encountered God in a powerful way. And she asked her family in South Africa to also go to Lesotho. God is at work on mission. He is an amazing God. He really is. Well, one of the things I want to pick up today that I noticed, especially... Hey, don't start the timing. I think it's unfair because I haven't started my message. Um, I, get, I get under pressure with this. There's something about this clock here. But anyway, uh, I just want to highlight a few people here today. As I stood there, I, I noticed, where's Raphael? Is he here? Uh, where's the worship? Wow. Okay, they went to the city, kids. And where's Daniela? Are you here? Where's cake? Can we have the worship team? Oh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Can you guys stand? Raphael, where's Daniela? Is she here? No? Raphael, how old are you? Can you shout? 20. Cake, how old are you? 18. And just watching young people in worship this morning. I don't know if you noticed that our worship is not just diverse and different people from different backgrounds, male and female, but actually is young and not so young. Um, um, <laughs> and, and it's just so profound, just seeing these guys at age 18 and 20 worshiping Jesus, loving Jesus. It just reminded of that story of David, you know, from very early on his heart and just being at, in, in the king's court and just worshiping and leading, uh, you know, the king in worship. And I just want to say, I just want to speak very briefly on that, just to say we need to pray for our young people. We need to pray because the enemy wants to steal them from the presence of God. Um, my children are very young. They're not this age, by the way. And, uh, but I'm jealous for your children to be running with the Lord. And I'm jealous that you would be at that point when my children get to that age, you would be praying for me as well. And one of the things that we do in this church is that we bring people forward when they're dedicating their children and we say we'll stand with them, isn't it? And we got to believe that. We got to mean that. So we got to do that because the world of social media over there, like Snapchat, like uh, uh, Facebook and Instagram, you know, is taking our children away, exposing TikTok into all kinds of things over there. And if we don't teach them here, if they don't train here, if we protect them from the word of God here and from the commitment of the passion and the purposes of God here, the world is going to teach them. And we got to understand that right now. So I want us to pray for our children in this place. Can we do that? Let us pray. I mean, you might not say, I don't have children. Hey, they are our children. They are our young people. They are our youth. They are our young people in this church. Amen? Come on, let's lift up our hands. Let's pray for them. Father. 
if you have a, your son or your daughter with you, why don't you hold their hand and just pray for them? Father, we thank you that you've given us young people who are so on fire for you in this place. Lord, we know that uh, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But you have come to bring life and abundant life. We pray, Lord, for every young person in the youth right now, that fill them with your Holy Spirit. Let them be on fire for Jesus. We don't want them, Lord, to be kind of casual and kind of coasting along in life. Lord, we pray, protect them, Lord, from the overexposure of the things of this world. And Lord, I pray, may we as parents play our part, but also may the church play her part in seeing young people come through. And I pray for Raphael, Daniela, Lord, and for Cake. I pray may your hand be upon them. Lord, protect them from the evil one. Lord, I pray for many of the ones that are represented here, young people who might not be in the room. Lord, bring them into this room. No, it doesn't have to be this church, but bring them in the room. Let them be in the room. Lord, I pray for salvation for our young people. May we see that right across the city that we'll see the youth, Lord, fill the church. The youth, Lord, on fire for Jesus. The youth will be worshiping Jesus. The youth abandoning their mobile phones for Jesus and choosing him over the mobile phone, over their private, uh, you know, social media thing that happens behind closed doors in their room. Goodness, who knows what happens there. We pray today that Jesus will be the one. There will be praying and seeking the face of Jesus. Lord, our hearts long for that. And I pray, would you come and do that? Can we really be believe God for this? That we'll see the youth swept into the church in masses, masses of the youth swept into the church. Father, if you are a parent here, <laughs> Why don't you pray in your heart right now? What is the prayer that you are longing to see in your heart for your son or daughter or sons and daughters? Father, give them not their heart's desires. Give them their heart's desires. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. That wasn't the message, but anyway, I hope it was a good message that came through. Um, if you got your Bible, please turn with me to John, uh, the Gospel of John. We're going to be reading from chapter 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. We, are, we have been going through this series called um, the David series, which uh, if you've been part of City Gates for a while, you'll be familiar with that. But today we, and uh, next week, we are just doing a short two-part series, and we're going to be focusing on Jesus and uh, titled uh, The Lamb of God or The Sacrificial Lamb of God. So I hope uh, I will serve you well now, but I don't, I'm not going to say everything and all the details, particularly with the resurrection and everything. I hope I'll leave that for next week, uh, whoever is preaching on that and his exaltation as well. But actually, I just want to talk about his sacrifice, what it means, and the sacrifice, the power of the Lamb in the Old Testament, the power of the Lamb in the New Testament, the power of the Lamb throughout history, the power of the Lamb into all eternity. Amen? Amen. That's kind of where we are going now. That's what we're going to be looking at. So John 1. The back story is this. Uh, that is, uh, John the Baptist has just entered the scene he is baptizing people left, right, center. He is calling people to come to repentance and to believe, and uh, believing in God to repent of their sins. And uh, as he's just coming on the scene, people are worried because they don't know who he, he is. They are not aware of his identity, and they want to check him out. They want to find out who this guy is. And uh, what they do is that the Pharisees, they send the Levites and the priests to go to John and find out who he is. And they arrive to John and they, they, they ask him questions like, who are you, John? Tell us who you are. Come on, you know, we want to know who you are. Are you Elijah? John says, no, I'm not. And uh, he, they say, are you, um, are, you, are you the prophet who was to come? He says, no, I'm not the prophet who was to come. Um, and then they say, are you the Messiah? And John says, I'm not. And, uh, and then the next day, John, he comes and tells them 
why he's here. He says, I'm here to prepare a way for someone else who is to come. And this is what he says. The next day he saw Jesus, verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. And then uh, verse 35. The next day after that, the next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked and Jesus, as Jesus walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. This is uh, the, the best moment in John's life. This is like the top of your career. This is like the, when you are really doing really well. John, everybody hears about John. And they know that he's been doing amazing, powerful things. This is a moment where John could elevate himself and exalt himself. Everybody wants to know who John is. But instead of John explaining who he is, he chooses this moment to celebrate the Lamb of God. And he says, it's not about me. It's not about the prophet who is to come. It's not about Elijah. It's about the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. And he makes space for the Lamb of God so that he decreases and the Lamb increases. And in your life right now, you might be doing well and life is going well for you. And that moment where life could be praising you and celebrating you, let me tell you this, is a moment where you got to decrease and allow the Lamb of God to increase. May Jesus increase in your life in this moment. May he be the one who takes the number one spot in your life. Let's behold the Lamb of God. Even as we saw the children um, come to the front here with their, their palm branches. Uh, I mean, in the first service, my son Dylan was standing there. And I, I looked at him. He's trying to poke the other child. with. The, I said, no, 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 that's not what it's for. That's not what it's for. The palm branches are, behold the Lamb of God. All right, we'll have a chat when I get home. But... Uh, <laughs> Behold, the Lamb of God who's been ushered in is riding on the donkey. He's going to ride on the clouds. This is the Lamb of God. Behold him. And by the way, I, that's what I want to do today. I, wanna, I just want to open the picture of the Lamb of God. So what we're going to do is so we're going to go on a journey from the Old Testament and look at and behold Jesus. So every moment I hope that the image of Jesus will become bright and clearer before your eyes. And you keep seeing the Lamb being displayed uh, throughout history as God unveils the Lamb. You know that in the future you will see the Lamb who's seated on the throne. The one that we've just been talking about. Amen. And the story begins with a man called Abraham. He is an Iraqi man, and uh, he's worshiping idols, as Joshua tells us in Joshua 24. And uh, he's just doing his own thing, and God calls him to himself. And uh, he changes his future. He changes his direction. He changes his purpose. He changes his vision, and he follows God. And I believe that there are people here today. You've come here, you've got your own plans in your life and your future, and you've planned things, but I believe God wants to change your direction. He's the one who comes and gives you a different purpose and a plan for the future. The Lamb of God wants to come and encounter you today. If you are here and you don't know Jesus, he wants to encounter you, like he encountered this man called Abraham. And this man called Abraham, not only was he encountered by God, God gave him massive promises. Firstly, he said, go to the land I will show you. He went to this land, and he took all the people who were with him, and his retinue, and his wife, and he got to the land. you got to realize that when he got to the land, he did not have any children. And God gave him another promise and says, look at the stars, look at the sand on the sea, so will your descendants be. And he looked at himself, and he thinking, how is that going to happen because I don't have a child? And the Lord says, I will provide. He will provide for the child. It's, the Bible says, Abraham believed God. He was very old, and he looked at himself, he looked at his wife. His wife laughed and thought, this is no way, considering our age, that this is going to happen. And let me say this, probably some of you here, where your circumstances are just so impossible, you are doubting that God can intervene. And that he's the God who rides over your circumstances, and he's beyond that. We've got to believe that. 
and sometimes it feels like your dream or your desire or your vision is as good as dead, and God can resurrect it just like that because he has the power to do that. Do we know that? Do we believe that? <laughs> okay, a lot of the time we don't believe that, but I hope that faith will arrive and we will believe that. So he is the man who is believing God, and the Bible says it was counted to him as righteousness. And God fulfilled this promise, and a son was born, and his name was called Isaac, and Abraham is really excited. He said, you see, God fulfills promises. He has a promise. God has fulfilled it. Amazing. He's a promise keeper, and he keeps every promise that he makes. But however, one day, God comes to Abraham, and he says to him, Abraham, yes, Lord, probably happy, the God who fulfills promises. He says, I want you to take your son, your one and only son, and, and go and sacrifice him for me. Really? Are there any fathers here? Now raise up your hand. Happy Mother's Day to the mothers. <laughs> I, was, I do celebrate you fathers, but it was Mother's Day. But imagine you've been asked that question. You know, you've been, that's what God says that to you. you you're gonna, something's going to happen in your, in your heart, isn't it? Um, I knew I was committed to God. I knew I loved God. I knew, but this is too much. God is asking too much. Have we ever come to that point where it feels like God is asking too much? I know, I know I've said I've given my life to you, but this is, man, I can't go beyond this. This is unfair. And Abraham got to that moment. And, uh, but Abraham still obeyed God. And that's why the book of Hebrews speaks of this man, Abraham, and the way he obeyed God, and he was faithful. And uh, here's Abraham. I'm sure his head was not lifted high. He wasn't, like, excited or chanting or worshiping in a way that shows exuberation and excitement. I don't think that was the case. I think he was troubled in his spirit, and he took his son, his one and only son, and uh, he took his donkey, and they, put, they gathered some wood, and uh, they got the fire, and he got his servant, and up they go to Mount Moriah. What are they going to do? Sacrifice his one and only son, and they walk this journey I'm sure he probably thought God uh, woke up on the wrong side of the bed that day. Was it God? Did I hear well? Was it the demon? Who was it? Who spoke to? Was it, you know, I, he's starting to die, but actually he goes up, he's walking. And then as he halfway through, I think it was, but the Bible doesn't say that. Halfway through, I'm sure, um, Isaac looks at everything around him and he realizes that there's the fire, there's the wood, the donkey, the servant, him and his daddy. And he said, dad, say, son, he says, um, the fire is here, the wood is here, where's the lamb? What would you say? Would you make it up? And Abraham says, son, God will provide. It is God who provides the lamb. And off they go. And then uh, they get closer and closer to Moriah. They get to the place there's still no lamb. What's going on here? I'm sure Abraham is starting to die, but he gets to this place, and uh, he comes to this altar. It might have been a, just a stone, a piece of stone, a boulder, and then he ties his son. He puts him down. Isaac realizes now, okay, it's not the, the sacrifice. It's not, it's not, the, it's not the, 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 the donkey. You know, we don't sacrifice donkeys. The sacrifice is not, it's not the servant. Uh, the sacrifice is me, and uh, he lies there the one and only son, and he's about to be sacrificed. And he, Abraham lifts his, his hand with his knife in his hand. And just as he was about to do it, and God from heaven says, Abraham, do not <laughs> kill your son. Now I know that you love me because you did not withhold your son, your one and only son whom you love for me. Why is that? It's because on that mountain there's another son whose father is going to watch as he's been, you know, led like a lamb for the slaughter. And that is who we are talking about here today. And that's the story of Genesis 20, 22. But actually what I'm trying, I want to bring to you today is this. There, there are, sometimes God gives us stuff, isn't it? Um, and you feel like God has given me something like an Isaac in my life. What is an Isaac in your life? that you know has been given to you almost like the promise. God is a promise keeper. I've been praying for him, to him to give me this, and he's given it to me. 
but then it becomes more than what God has given. It becomes an idol in my life. It becomes more than God in my life. What is that? What has God given you that he, was, he gave it to you? Whether prophetically, he gave it to you. Whether you were praying for a child, he gave you a son. Whatever you were praying, whatever your job, a company, a business, and he's given it to you. But he's taken the number one spot in your life now and has replaced God. God wants to say, put it on the altar. Will you do it? It's going to hurt, but put it on the altar. Because when you do, you will get it better. Because by the time Isaac came from that altar, Abraham, he went from Isaac, who was a child of Abraham, to Isaac, who is the son of the promise. And God wants to shape your thinking. It might be idols in our lives. And idols are not bad things. Woo, did I just say that? Idols are good things that are turned into ultimate things. What are some of the idols in your life that are not bad things? In fact, they've been given to you by God, but they've become everything in your life to a point that the image of God is disappearing before us because this is more important. God wants to say, put it on the altar right now and let him sort it out in your heart. You might want to do that right now in your heart. Even as I'm speaking now, you know what that is. He wants to say, give it to me and I'll give it to you better. But it's not just that. We have the God who provides the lamb because as he's just about to do to kill his son he looks and there's a ram caught in the thicket and God says that's the one you are to sacrifice I'm not asking you to sacrifice your son because there's another son who's coming who's going to be sacrificed and then that's that from that mountain Abraham knew that God had called his son to be the son of the promise because the lamb was provided on Isaac's behalf now, Isaac then becomes this great, not just a, a great man, but this great nation. The nation of Israel, who they find themselves in Egypt. God had said to Abraham that one day they'll end up in Egypt. So we are moving from Genesis 22 now to Exodus 12. They find themselves in Egypt. They've been there for hundreds of years, and Pharaoh starts to oppress them. And he's oppressing them, and God does not like it. He calls Israel his firstborn son. He says, Israel is my son, my firstborn son. And that's why the Bible says, out of Egypt, I call my son. And he doesn't like the fact that his son in Egypt, in a form of a nation, has been oppressed. And God sends Moses to go and speak to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh hardens his heart at least about nine times, plague after plague, upon this nation of Egypt. Until God says, tell Pharaoh, I'm coming for his firstborn son. Because Israel is my firstborn son. He's treating Israel like this. I'm coming for his firstborn son. And then he gives Moses instructions. Are you still with me? Oh, good. Okay, I was just checking. He gives Moses instructions, and he says to Moses, I'm coming for Pharaoh today. I'm coming for the gods of Pharaoh. I'm coming for the firstborn of Pharaoh. I'm coming even for the animals, firstborn of all the animals. I'm coming for Egypt today. But as for you, Israel, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take a lamb, every household, take a lamb, each household will take a lamb and sacrifice a lamb, and then take the blood of the lamb and smear it or put it on the, the doorpost of your, your house. And, and be so, he says, because when I come and I see the blood of the lamb, I will pass over. And that's where we get the, the Passover from. And... and can you imagine this? So he says, take the lamb, sacrifice the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost. Actually, he also says, do not break the lamb's bones. You'll see that in John. So his bones were not broken. Do not break it. And take the meat and enjoy it. Take the meat and enjoy it. But actually, he says, do not boil the meat, uh, roast it. Sounds like South African, isn't it? With a barbecue, like, yeah. And roast the meat and the and get ready, we, you know, do the, you know, bread, you know, bake bread, and don't use yeast or uh, leaven, and get ready because I'm about to set you free from slavery today. And uh, can you imagine two men, 
two Israelites in the land of Goshen, which was where Israel had, the Israelites lived. Can you imagine that afternoon as they were getting ready? Two Israelites, two guys. Can we shout out their names? Can you think of names of two men? Any names? Gabriel. Oh, Gabriel's repeating himself. He was there last night. So that's it. Gabriel and who else? Simon and Gabriel. Okay, these two guys are going for a stroll. They're Simon and Gabriel. And they're going for a stroll and they're just walking around. They're good friends. And they talk about, they're talking about what is to happen. What's going to happen tonight? And I uh, say, have you heard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, did you hear what Moses said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, about uh, the lamb and about the sacrifice and stuff. Yeah, yeah, I heard that. Have you done it? Yeah, 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 I've done it. So Gabriel then says, um, yeah, I've done it. And I feel like I'm going to just enjoy the roasted amazing meats from the lamb tonight. And I'm just going to love it. And, uh, and uh, have you got all the herbs, and the, the bitter herbs? Oh, I've got it. I've got the bread. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready for tonight. Have you put the blood? Yeah, yeah, I put the blood. So Gabriel says that. And then Simon says, I've been wanting to talk to you about that because I feel a bit nervous about tonight. And I'm a little bit nervous because I feel like, you know, all the stuff I've done in my life and all that. And uh, do you remember some of the stuff I've been telling you on our, as, a running, as my running partner? Um, I've been telling you stuff. And... Uh, how, what if, the, what if uh, God passes over tonight and actually he looks through the keyhole, he peeps through it and he sees me in there? Uh, what if he comes inside and kills me like any other person here in other households? I'm really nervous. And the other guy said, oh, I didn't, I didn't th- that's not what Moses said. Moses said, let's put the blood and all that. He says, yeah, I feel like I'm going to sit in the corner, crunch up, and then I'm going to, I'm going to just like, we, I'm watching a horror movie, and uh, I'm just going to wait and see if God sees me inside. One is nervous. One is celebrating. He feels like he's going to have a party. And then the evening comes. God passes over. What do you think? Which one of the two is going to be spared and which one is going to die of the two men? Gabriel and Simon. Uh, Jesus knew what, when they were muttering what, he was, what they were saying. I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> which one? Both of them are going to be spared. Why? Because God does not look at what is in Simon's heart. Not you, Simon. Uh, he doesn't look at what's in Simon's necessarily his heart and all that. And the things he's, he looks at the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. That is enough and sufficient to save this man from all that's going to happen. Which means when God looks at you, he looks at the blood of Jesus that is painted on your doorpost. It's not about you. And a lot of us spend a lot of our time in our lives in this state of anxiety, to worry, am I going to make it into the, the new heavens and the new earth? Do you think God is, is pleased with me? Do you think all of these things, the, way, the enemy wants to steal our joy? Let us be like the Gabriel guy who's like, I'm just going to enjoy this great salvation today. Because when the Lord passes over, I know the lamb has done it. Look on the other side. The lamb, the blood of the lamb is what God sees. God looks at the blood, and when he sees the blood in your life, the door of your heart, he passes over. It doesn't doesn't matter what we've done. It is the blood that counts more than anything. And, uh, and then they, 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 these guys, they, 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 you know, Exodus 12 now, and they, they are set free, and they go through the, the Red Sea as of dry land. We enter now in Leviticus 5, and in Leviticus, they've settled themselves now in, this, in the wilderness, and uh, God gives them instructions about how to live and all that. And then he says, if any one of you is guilty of sin, and uh, you know you are guilty of sin, and or you don't know, and you become aware of it. What you gotta do is you take a lamb again, and uh, sacrifice a lamb, or bring it to the priest. The priest will help you to sacrifice, inspect your lamb again, and see if it's a lamb without defect, like they did in Exodus. And then take that lamb and sacrifice it. So the priest will take the, the blood of the lamb and put it on the, 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 the atonement uh, cover, and, uh, and then the, the rest of the blood will go under the, the bronze altar. And then the, the flesh will then be cast out and be burned outside of the city, which means it doesn't matter <laughs> if I come today burdened with my sin, I know that my sin are upon the shoulders of the lamb. 
and, uh, and in the same way, our sin are upon the shoulders of the Lamb. And because that Jesus Christ is the one who has atoned for our sin. And this is called the atonement. And uh, the thing is, the, uh, the question is, what is this atonement? And uh, obviously, people have used different words. To, uh, the, the Hebrew word is this word, kafar, um, which really means just to cover. Um, God is going to come when we are being exposed. We've been made to look naked. The world has made us look like this. God is going to, through his blood, is going to cover that. God is covering us today. Maybe you are here today, like, like Adam and Eve. Remember what sin did? It uncovered them. <laughs> it's almost like for the first time I realized I'm uncovered. And God took the, took the skin and he covered them. In the same way, God takes the, the skin of the lamb and he covers us. And uh, God wants to cover us from our guilt of sin and all that. It's not us. It's what's covered us. And some of you, maybe you've been uncovered. Maybe your faith has been uncovered by the world God wants to come and restore your faith and cover you again. Maybe your dignity has been uncovered by the world, the circumstances, things that were sad in your life. And God wants to come and cover you again. He's the one who, the lamb can cover you. Maybe your confidence has been stolen and you feel uncovered in your confidence. God wants to come and cover you again. Maybe your authority has been uncovered and you feel sometimes, you feel like you can't exercise authority. It feels as though it's been stolen in your life. God wants to come and cover you. He's the one who atones for our sins. Maybe your identity has been uncovered a little bit. And the world has been telling you stuff that has have stolen your identity today. God wants to say to you, the lamb is going to come. His blood is going to cover you today and come over you today. Let us not allow the world or the enemy to steal because we are covered by the blood of the lamb. Amen. God is covering us. And these people finally and they are able to establish themselves in the land that God had called them to, to establish. And then God raised up prophets. And prophets begin to speak about the lamb in a different way to how it has been spoken before. And the, all along we realize the lamb is just an animal, isn't it? Just an animal that sacrifice. But Isaiah comes on the scene and helps us in Isaiah 53. And the lamb just becomes a lamb who morphs into a lamb servant. It's almost like it is a human thing. It's a human object. It's not just a, an animal. It's also a human being. And it speaks about the servant of the Lord, who is also the lamb. So now the, another image of the lamb has been unveiled. We're beginning to see who this lamb is. Isaiah 53, this is what it says about the lamb. If, if you have read it, it says he was oppressed. We think he's talking about a man. He was oppressed and afflicted, the lamb. Yet he did not open his mouth. So this is a meek and lowly servant of God. And he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Isaiah is taking the image of the lamb and bringing it to the image of the servant and bringing them together. The servant lamb has come on the scene and he says, this one is the one that's going to come. And why is he coming? He's coming because... All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What does God send? He sends a servant who is also the lamb. The lamb is the answer. He is the power in all of history to overcome. He doesn't sound just a, a big roaring lion. He's about to be a lion in the future, but right now it's just a lamb. He comes for our transgressions. Our transgressions, I think it means we have, there's, a, there's a line that God has drawn in the sand and we've just crossed the line. We have transgressed. He comes for our iniquities. Iniquities means we were crooked, and God now is going to realign us and make us straight. He comes because all of us have gone astray. And because he comes because we have turned on our own ways, doing our own stuff in the city of Dubai. It's all about us, not about the lamb anymore. He has come because we have sinned. That's what Isaiah said. But actually, the lamb is about to be slain. He is about to take Everything that you deserve, which is the punishment that is supposed to come upon you, is about to come upon the servant of the Lord, who himself is also the lamb. Are we together? And this lamb, this is what the Bible says in Isaiah 53. He was despised, rejected. This is all what's supposed to happen in your life, to you. But it's going to happen on the lamb. He was despised, rejected. He experienced suffering and pain. 
punishment, stricken, afflicted, pierced, crushed, wounded, oppressed, slaughtered, judged, cut off, and lastly, death. The Lamb of God dies for you and I. The slain Lamb of God dies. But who is this? Who is this Lamb of God? The eunuch, an Ethiopian man, goes to Jerusalem. We are now coming to the New Testament. We are crossing over. The eunuch, the, the, the Ethiopian man, goes to worship in Jerusalem. And uh, he comes back in Acts 8 on his way back from Jerusalem. And uh, he's walking and he opens this Isaiah 53, and he's reading, he was pierced for our transgressions, and then smitten, stricken, and, he's, and then he sees Philip go by, and he said, sorry, Jew? Yeah, I'm a Jew. Can you come and help me? I'm reading. Who's the prophet talking about here? And Philip says, he's talking about someone who's the Lamb of God, who I'm about to tell you now. And he tells me about this man who's just now been revealed. The one that, John 1, we are back to John 1 now. The one that John reveals, and he says, it's not about me. It's about the Lamb of God. He says, it's about the Lamb of God. And the Lamb of God can change your life right now, eunuch. And the eunuch says, I want the Lamb in my life. May the Lamb come and set me free. And the eunuch's life is transformed there and then. And he goes away baptized and set free and saved all the way to tell others about the slain Lamb of God. The power is in the slain Lamb. He changes lives. He changed all of history and he's about to change more lives and he will change your life. And then John says, behold the Lamb. And then later, Jesus enters Jerusalem. He's riding on a donkey as we just saw here. The Bible says he set his face like flint facing Jerusalem. Why? Because something was going to happen. The slaying of the lamb was about to happen. He arrived, and before that, he had told his disciples, drink my blood, eat my flesh. And they were like, ah, what are you talking about? And everyone else who had been listening to him decided to part and, and, and move away from him. And uh, the disciples said, we can't go anywhere because we are stuck with you, you realize that. And, uh, but they couldn't do anything. And they didn't understand what he said because he was saying that one day they're going to enjoy this feast which is based upon the slain lamb of God, which is the Lord's Supper, which will foreshadows what is to come, which is the supper of the lamb in the future when we'll sit on Mount Zion enjoying the lamb. They don't understand this. And then Jesus in the Passover, they have a Passover meal and he's passing bread to them and says, this is what's going to happen to my body. And then he passes the, the wine. He says, this is how my blood is going to be poured out for the salvation of many, as John said, for the sins of the world. And then eventually, Jesus, the day comes, he's led to go and see these two men. And the first one was a, a Roman governor, which represent Gentiles. The second man was Herod, which represent the, Jew, uh, the Jews. And uh, he comes and he appears because now the lamb has come on the scene. We got to do all the things that the Old Testament has been talking about. The first thing we got to do is we got to inspect the lamb. So they inspect the lamb. The first thing they inspect the lamb is that they bring the lamb before Herod. Sorry, before Pilate. Pilate looks at the lamb and he's, he asks him a few questions. He says, send him to Herod. And Herod comes, he expects Jesus to do miracles and all that, and Jesus doesn't do that. He asks Jesus a few questions, Jesus doesn't answer. He says, send him back to Pilate. And Pilate says to, to all of Israel, he says, look, Herod and myself have inspected your lamb. We find no fault in your lamb. The lamb cannot be sacrificed because he is without fault and without defect. This is the perfect lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And now, from this moment, Jesus is led to the cross. It's like that moment on Moriah when uh, Abraham leads his son, the, the father from heaven, leads his one and only son to the cross. And as he gets to the cross, I'm sure you, you're probably thinking, oh, yeah, this is a heartless father who is in heaven is watching his son. No, the heart of the father, very similar to Abraham, the heart of the father was pumping. Do you know why the father was doing that? Do you know why he gave his one and only son? For you and I, that one day we will know the lamb, we will worship the lamb, we'll be removed from our life in this moment into the, the life of eternity where we are with the lamb forever. And uh, Jesus gets to the cross, and when he arrives at the cross, everything that Isaiah was talking about 
happened. He was stricken, smitten. He was, he was abused. He was persecuted. He was despised. Everything happened. He was exposed in every way. The Son of God who is the Lamb. And He did it for you and for me. He took our place on the cross. And He was pierced for our transgressions. And in that moment, when that moment came and Jesus was pierced, the blood spilled which is the blood that's now on our hearts, which is the most precious blood we can ever have. And when that moment happened, <laughs> we can now come and hide under the blood because God is about to pass over in, the, in his judgment of the earth, but we are hidden in the son the father loves, which means he passed over. God did not spare his son. He asked Abraham to spare his son. But if he had spared his son, you and I would have been in trouble right now. But he didn't do that. And Jesus was crucified. And, uh, and they looked at the, the two men who was crucified with Jesus and Jesus. And uh, they broke the bones of the two. And they come to Jesus and they realize he's already there. We can't break the lamb's bones. And Jesus Christ breathed his last breath and said, it is finished. And he died for you and for me. And Peter says this. He says, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was precious, the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. His blood, His blood is worthy. His blood is precious. His blood does not expire and is over you today. When you entered this place, you were covered with the blood of the Lamb. Today, you are here today by the blood of the Lamb. You wake up in the morning tomorrow, you are who you are by the blood of the Lamb. There's value in this blood. It's not about you, it's about the blood of the Lamb. This reminds me of a story in the, in the, in the 18th century of these, uh, these in Morovia, which is uh, in the Czech Republic. Um, these, this was a group of pietists or people who were so devoted to God, and they had discovered that salvation does not come because we have to pay indulgences, because the, the Catholic Church had said, if you want to have safe passage to heaven one day, you need to be paying m money in order to make a way for yourself to the priest. And they discovered through Martin Luther that a man is justified by faith alone. Amen? If you were justified by paying God anything, there's nothing that God, we can pay him for. It's the blood that we bring before God. That's the only thing that purchases our sin. And when these people, it was a large group of people, discovered this and they didn't want to go with the, the, the Catholic Church, they were persecuted. And they fled from Moravia and they ended up in a place in Germany, uh, in a place called Hernhurt. But they ended up at this man's place. This man called Nicholas Count Ludwig von Zinzendorf. Can you repeat that? Ah, <laughs> uh, you, you're just telling the bit you remember, yeah? Nicholas Ludwig Count von Zinzendorf. Ah, uh, yeah. You can count Zinzendorf, yeah? Count Zinzendorf, Count Zinzendorf. So Zinzendorf, he is a man who comes from an extremely wealthy family. His parents die when he's young, and he grows up with his grandmother, and they have incredible wealth and a huge estate, and they have all they need. And one day he goes to, I think it's Dusseldorf, and he's walking around. He goes to, uh, into a gallery there. He's, he's kind of, you know, touring. He's just finished his studies, and he, that's like he's doing a gap year, trying to work out what to do with his life. And he walks into a gallery, and he looks at a painting on the wall, and this is a painting called Eke Homo um, in, in Latin, which means uh, behold the man. And it's a picture of Jesus. And uh, he looks at it, it's a picture of Jesus, the lamb is there, and with blood dripping down like that, and he, he has um, the crown of thorns around him. And uh, written below that is this, this is what I did for you, <laughs> what would you do for me? 
and it arrested his heart. Zinzendorf went back, a changed man, and he arrived back in Hernhof, and he was a different man altogether. Now, by the time the refugees arrived, the, the Moravians arrived, and they say, we are looking for a place to take refuge, and, and Dusseldorf said, you can use my place. Why don't you use my place? And uh, they built a village on his land. And, and then what happened was, after they built the village, he realized that although they were, they were fighting against the oppression of their church back in, in, uh, in Moravia, actually, they don't get on. There, there's, a, there's, there's clashes and relational difficulty between them. And he goes before God and he prays and he's seeking the face of God uh, one day. And as he's praying, seeking the face of God, and God reveals to him in the scriptures, the, the passage in Leviticus 6, uh, 13, which speaks of the fire of God not, not dying out in, on the altar. And he praises, and this is what I want to see here. And he arranges a 24-7 prayer meeting. By the way, that's a meeting that went on. From that day, the meeting went on for at least over 100 years. These people were set on fire, and they were so radically set on fire for God. Do you know what the big thing that set them on fire? was the Lamb of God. They had a revelation of the Lamb of God. They say, if Jesus has done this for us, the Lamb has been slain and sacrificed for us, what are we going to do? And the revival broke out in that place, in that moment. And in 1727, they saw amazing revival as a result of that prayer, which lasted 100, over 100 years. <laughs> Why don't we pray for that today? We pray for revelation of the Lamb to a point that the power of the slain lamb will be revealed in the house. And not only did that happen, <laughs> they, they encountered God. They had this great revival. Things were happening, and they said, this is not enough. We have not. We feel like our life has not counted. Um, we want our life to count. Do you want your life to count? May your life count for the, for the lamb. And uh, so they went across the world for the first time, missionaries went across the world to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Some of them, the Moravians came into my country, my land of South Africa. I'm here today because the Moravians went from there. And they came to South Africa. They went to Turkey. They went to the United States of America. And they also went to the Caribbeans. But the problem in the Caribbeans was this, that they couldn't come because they came from the West and only slaves and slave masters were allowed. Do you know what they did? They said, we want to sell ourselves into slavery. They sold themselves into slavery so that they might be captured and be used as slaves only for the lamb. They say, even selling ourselves, that's still nothing compared to what the lamb has accomplished. And uh, when they boarded, they set sail, about to set sail, they got on their boats and uh, in order to say goodbye to their family members, who they were leaving behind, and, uh, and never to see them again. These guys are captivated with the vision of the slain lamb. And I, when they got on, the, on, on their boats, they waved. And this is their cry, their cry both sides, on that side and this side. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. Can we say it? May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. This, their mission, they believed was the reward of his suffering. Let me ask you, has there been a reward of the suffering of the lamb in your life? What is the reward of the suffering of the lamb in your life? Or am I just living this casual life? And if I've got time, I make it for Jesus. Um, you gotta, you know, you gotta know I'm really busy in my life. You know, I've got a really busy job. It's a really important job. What is the reward of his suffering in your life? My, uh, my prayer for City Gate is this: May the Lamb receive the reward of his suffering through my life, through your life, through those who go to mission, through those who enter city. If the Lamb does not receive, what has He died for? And Revelation, it says, with your blood, you have purchased for God a people from every tribe, tongue, and language. And one day in the future, this is now the power of the Lamb in the future. In the future, new heavens and new earth. This is what John sees from heaven. He sees the elders in heaven, 
he sees the four living creatures. He sees the throne and the one who's seated on the throne. And he's about to say, oh, the lamb died. Um, I wonder if the lamb's going to make it in the future. And, and then they said, by the way, there is no one worthy enough to open. There's a scroll. There's a book that that's can't be opened. It's before everyone. And then he says, he wept. Because it was said that no one is worthy to open this book. And, and they looked around. They couldn't find anyone. The angels, anyone? The four living creatures, anyone? Is there anyone there? Is there anyone there? Do you know what? They said, one, one angel said, one elder said, don't worry. Do not weep about the book of history. Because there is, we have found one who's worthy. Who's this? The, tr- the lion from the tribe of Judah is worthy to open the scroll. Who's the lion from the tribe of Judah? Just when you think this guy with military might and strength will appear before God. you know what appears? A lamb. A lamb appears and stands in the middle of history, in the middle of the elders, in the middle of the four living creatures, in the middle of the myriads of angels, in the middle of creation, in the middle of everything, stands the slain Lamb of God with seven horns. We speak of authority and rule and might and power. He is the one who says, now we have found the one who is worthy of it all, who can open the scroll and his seals, and with his blood he's purchased for God a people from every tribe, tongue, and nations. He is worthy of of heaven. He is worthy of earth. He is worthy of all creation. Is he worthy in your life? Is he worthy to ask you to do things that are currently uncomfortable, like Abraham? Is he worthy enough that the blood that is smeared on the doorpost is enough that you don't doubt God's salvation? Is he worthy enough that your sin, when God says your sin is taken away, has been atoned for, that you truly believe that? Is he worthy enough that you know that the power is not in you, but is in the blood? May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. Can you close your eyes where you are? The Moravian says, they ask a question, a rhetorical question. Is there any passion too extreme for the lion? Is there any offering too extravagant for the lion? Is there any commitment too radical for the lion? I'm going to ask again. Can I get the worship band to come? Is there any passion too extreme for the lion? Is there any offering too extravagant for the lion? Is there any commitment too radical for the lion? City gates, may the Lamb receive the reward of his suffering here among us. Is Jesus your Lord and your Savior? Let us stand together. Let's lift up our hands as we are about to worship. Like God provided to Abraham. He will provide for us. He is faithful. Like God found no fault in the Israelites because of the Lamb, He finds no fault because of the blood of the Lamb. With Jesus, no one is beyond mercy, forgiveness, and saving. He wants to save. His arms are wide open for us here. When sin abounds, the Bible says grace abounds even more. He offers us rest for those who are in their, their minds and their hearts are in toil today. He is our Sabbath. The, the Lamb has come to set us free from all the things of this world. He is not just their Savior. He is also the King. And uh, just close your eyes today. Is Jesus your Savior? But when it comes to your finance, you are Lord. Is Jesus your Savior? But when it comes to your future, you are Lord. Is Jesus your Savior? When it comes to your marriage, you are the Lord of the house. Is Jesus your Savior? When it comes to your children, you are, the, you are Lord. Is Jesus your Savior? And when it comes to your parents, they are Lord. Or is Jesus your Savior? When it comes to your vision and your career, you are Lord. Jesus wants to be worthy of it all today. Can you tell him that? Can you tell him that? Can you tell the slain lamb, you are worthy of my life. You are worthy of my life. He's worthy of the whole of Scripture as we just saw. 
He's worthy of history as we just saw. He's worthy in the future as you just saw. But the, real, the question is, is he worthy right now? The Lamb is here today. Would we give him the glory and the honor that he deserves? Just in your heart, just come before the Lamb. Just come before him. Let Jesus come into our hearts, into our mind, that we actually enjoy him to a point, that actually we get goosebumps just enjoying him, that he's all about him today, the Lamb. May it be about the Lamb. I'm going to hand over to the worship team today. And as I do that, may God do something in your heart.